Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. So today uh, we're going to cover another topic that has been on my list for a while. And it's, you know, Tracy and I often talk about our lists and their length and sometimes something will be on the list and you're really into it. But then as as you're working on other projects, other things kind of move around. It's a very shifting list for me anyway. Oh, me too. Um, And then my memory was jogged about this particular topic by contemporary television, as is often the case, Uh, specifically the Apple TV Plus animated series Central Park. That show did not sponsor this episode, but it does include a song in its opening that very briefly mentions the people that lived in New York's Central Park before it was Central Park. And it kind of makes it a joke that, hey, we don't talk about that. Um, This was a reference to Seneca Village, and that reminder of it put it back at the top of the list for me. And Seneca Village is significant because this story features a predominantly Black community in New York that built itself from the ground up. But this story is also fragmented because even though it existed at a time when it could have been fairly well documented, there was a vested interest in erasing it. And we're going to talk about that. But first, we will talk about the island of Manhattan and how this one area of it came to be sold off in lots and thus became Seneca Village. So... If you're looking into the story, the story of Seneca Village often is told with the beginning being the selling of land by John and Elizabeth Whitehead. But that, of course, leaves out how the Whiteheads came into possession of that land. So first, what we really have to do is talk about Manhattan and how it went from being indigenous land to being the property of Europeans. Manhattan Island was, according to the version from the point of view of Western history that you have probably heard many times before, purchased from indigenous tribes in the area by Peter Minuit, the first director of the New Netherlands province in 1626. And the purchase price was, according to these accounts and depending on the source you look at, 60 guilders, about the value of a pound and a half of silver at the time, or $24 sometimes, or you'll see it said that it was just a bunch of beads and trinkets. So this entire purchase, though, is a moment in history that's difficult to untangle. It's even harder to substantiate. For one, the primary source on that transaction is a letter written by Peter Shagan, who was the representative of the state's general in the assembly of the 19 of the West India Company, This is a letter he wrote back to the West India Company, and he stated, quote, they have purchased the island Manhattas from the Indians for the value of 60 guilders. But that is the entirety of the contemporary documentation. That alleged purchase has also been represented in various painted depictions as the Dutch representative showing the Lenape leaders a trunk of various European items ostensibly as goods that they were intending to trade for the land. Right. So um, not that those paintings are intended to be historically accurate accounts, but even if that were the case, (laughs) it's just completely muddling what the actual situation was. Because these depictions, unsurprisingly, make out those indigenous leaders as foolish enough to trade their land for beads or something similarly worthless. Uh, This harkens back to our prior episode that we did on Thomas Harriet, who wrote the influential book, A Brief and True Report of the Newfound Land of Virginia, in which he characterized the indigenous population of North America as easily awed by Europeans and thus easy to manipulate. And if you recall that episode, That book was very popular in Europe and got republished a whole bunch of times and kind of became the foundation of how Europeans saw North American indigenous peoples. And that frequently cited number of $24 as the purchase price was literally just something that got calculated out as that story was written about in subsequent years. It was an estimate by historians that then started to be relayed as though it was fact. Plus, this whole story puts a lot of significance on one line in a letter. That one line is just casually reported with no nuance, and it was written by somebody with a minimal understanding of the indigenous people he was referring to, that understanding minimal at best. I mean, he really did not know a lot. Uh, It conveniently leaves out the probability that those people probably did not see the situation in the same way as the Dutch, who were seeing it as a business deal. The idea of land as property, as something you could own, was not even part of how their culture functioned. 
It's entirely possible that the Lenape were seeing the goods being presented by Minuet as a gift or as an offering to garner permission to live on the same land as the Lenape people who were already living on Manhattan. Modern-day Lenape people have stated that memorials in New York that reference the sale of Manhattan are perpetuating a fabricated myth. Um, We have talked some more about, like, the nuances of how a different, totally different indigenous people, but still indigenous people in North America, were thinking about land use in that episode earlier this year on King Philip's War. Yeah, yeah. Um, It is that thing where, obviously, this whole story that we get normally is from the white European lens. But regardless of all of that lost nuance, the Dutch did believe that they had ownership, and they made Manhattan the center of their colonization efforts. And when frustrated that the Lenape were not moving out, they built a wall around their new city in the 1660s to keep the indigenous people out of it. It also kept out the English for a time. England took control of New Netherland in 1664 and renamed it New York. This is, of course, part of much bigger conflicts that were going on. Uh, In the 1670s, the Dutch once again regained control of the island briefly, but it ultimately reverted to English rule in the 1674 Treaty of Westminster. And, of course, after the Revolutionary War, it was part of the United States and became land that got sold off by the government in various ways. So as we're talking about the section of Manhattan that became Seneca Village being farmland that was owned by John and Elizabeth Whitehead, That's the backstory before it passed into the white European real estate cycle. The Whiteheads had purchased the property in 1824, and then they partitioned it into lots to resell. The area that made up Seneca Village was about five acres in total. I've also seen it listed as almost seven. Uh, And it sits in the strip between 7th and 8th Avenues, running from present-day 82nd Street to 89th Street. In 1825, the lots that would become Seneca Village went up for sale. And while it is very hard to imagine, if you're familiar with New York City today, that area was considered remote enough from the main city that the land there was fairly inexpensive. Fifty lots were sold in total over the course of several years. The first purchaser was Andrew Williams, who was a boot black and a resident of downtown. He bought three lots for $125. The next two people who bought lots were Epiphany Davis, who bought 12 lots for $578, and John Carter. And all three of these first three buyers were Black. That's notable, considering that New York's date of final emancipation was still two years away. You'll recall, of course, that New York had this, like, very stepped and gradual way of eliminating slavery, and they weren't to the end of that yet. Two of these buyers, Epiphany Davis and Andrew Williams, were also members of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Epiphany was actually a church trustee. And that church was the city's first black church. And at the time, it was described as possibly being the largest and wealthiest black church in the country. It's unclear exactly how Williams and Davis had heard about the Whitehead's land for sale, but word clearly spread through the church. A week after the first lots were sold, the church itself purchased several connected lots from the Whiteheads. AME Zion lost their access to the city's potter's field in 1827 when that land was reallocated to become Washington Square Park. And at that point, several of the church's lots in Seneca Village were set aside to develop them into a cemetery. Purchases of the Whitehead land made by prominent leaders within the church continued for several years. By the time all 50 lots were sold by the Whiteheads in 1832, 24 of them had been purchased by Black residents of the city. Seneca Village had formed, although where that name came from is still unknown today. Uh, In case people are like, well, obviously the Seneca lived in New York. That's true, but like we don't know. We don't know how the village came to be called that. We'll talk about it in a minute, but there are... Often when you see the village referred to in contemporary papers of the day, it is referred to with a racial slur. So in just a moment, we will talk about other Black communities of historical significance to contextualize Seneca Village a little bit. Uh, But first, we will pause for a word from a sponsor. We recently talked on the show about New Philadelphia, Illinois, which was touted as the first town designed and plotted out by a Black man, and that did not happen until the 1830s. But unlike New Philadelphia, Seneca Village's establishment as a community was a little bit more organic. 
even though those plots were like separated out and and made as as parcels of land that were sold, it wasn't planned as a community. It was just broken into those lots. And we know that by 1829, there were nine families in Seneca Village for certain, and that's based on records as well as archaeological evidence. There may have actually been more. We should mention as well that there was another area of Manhattan that had a similar Black community, which predated Seneca Village. It was on a 30-acre piece of land known as York Hill because of its elevation. This community's origin on the timeline is a little bit unclear, but there do appear to be mentions of it in the 18-teens. Some of this area was city property, but some of it was also privately owned. Ultimately, York Hill's downfall was the creation of the Croton Reservoir. This water system, which was developed in the late 1830s and early 1840s, had been preceded by the city acquiring all of the property in York Hill and displacing that community. Many of them had moved to Seneca Village. That uncertainty that we mentioned just a moment ago about how many people were living in Seneca Village early on is actually a problem that persisted for much of its history. We know that in the time immediately following the Croton Reservoir displacement of York Hill, Seneca Village had grown to a population of more than 100 residents. And we also know that Irish immigrants started moving into the village starting in the 1840s, including the mother of future Tammany Hall boss George Washington Plunkett. George and his twin brother were actually born in Seneca Village. And by that time, the African Union Church had also bought land from the Whiteheads and moved in. It's significant that the Whiteheads were willing to sell their land to Black buyers as that offered an affordable entry into holding property that was unavailable in most of Manhattan. The residents of the village were more likely than New Yorkers of any color anywhere in the city to own the land where they lived. In order to vote in New York, free Black men had to have lived in the state for three years and had to own land valued at $250 or more. So the Seneca Village land opened up an avenue for Black residents in the city to meet that property requirement. In the 1850s, 10 of Seneca Village's Black residents were voters. And while that is a tiny number, it was by percentage far higher than in other communities within the city. In 1845, for example, there were 13,000 Black New Yorkers, and only 91 of them had voting rights. In 1855, the Black population of Manhattan was recorded at 12,000. There were still fewer than 100 who had secured voting rights. And that meant that at the time, with only about 150 Black residents, Seneca Village was home to more than 10% of the city's Black voters. There were also people who were not residents of Seneca Village, but owned land there in order to attain voting rights. So if you look at Black voting landholders in Seneca Village, instead of the population of the village, that concentration is even higher. Yeah, there were definitely people that chose to stay downtown as where they lived, but they wanted to own this property. uh, And that, once again, opened up uh, voting opportunities for them. In 1855, a census was taken, so the information about the village during that time becomes much more robust. There were 230 people living in Seneca Village then, in the village's 52 homes, so a lot of these were families. Roughly two-thirds of the residents were Black, uh, roughly one-third was Irish, and there were a few German residents as well making their homes there. There were also three churches in the village by that point. African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, which was the one that was there from the beginning, African Union Church, and All Angels Church. AME, Zion, and African Union were all Black churches. All Angels, however, had a mixed congregation and was a mission project of St. Michael's, which was at Broadway and 99th, and that also had a Sunday school as part of it. The cemetery associated with All Angels was also integrated. And there was also a school in the village known as Colored School Number 3 that had been founded in the 1840s. So now we're going to start getting to how this was turned into a park. Starting in the 1840s, there was growing interest in ensuring that the rapidly growing city retained some kind of green space for Manhattan's residents. This was a valid concern because the natural land on the island was being sold off and built up at a really quick rate. In the space of just a decade, from 1845 to 1855, the population of New York City doubled. It was also driven in part by a desire on the part of the wealthiest inhabitants of the city to have a green space similar to something that you might find in a European city. Yeah, as New York was building up, they were like, we should have fancy places like Paris or London so that rich people can take their carriages through them. 
and we will feel very worldly and fancy. There was a lot of debate about exactly where a large park might fit into Manhattan's layout. There was a 150-acre strip of land on the East River that was considered, but that was met with criticism because the size was deemed too small by a lot of the people who really wanted this park. Uh, There was also some concern that the park had been suggested by the editor of the Evening Post, William Cullen Bryant, because he and many of his idea's supporters, to put it there, happened to own property very near that site, and they would have gotten a financial boost from a park project that would have raised the value of their own land. Incidentally, Bryant Park is named for him, so he did get a park. That strip of land on the East River was known as Jones Woods, and as that lost favor as an option, the idea of a park in the center of the island started to gain popularity. There were a number of factors that made this location more appealing than the previous one. For one thing, a lot of the land there was already owned by the city, whereas the Jones Wood strips had been privately owned and would have required a pretty big investment on the city's part. For another, that central strip of land had already been deemed tricky to develop as real estate because of its terrain. This kind of cracks me up because if you look at cities from, or at maps rather from the early 1800s of New York City, it all had like terrain that would have been tricky. Somehow they managed. <laughs> Many uh, cities do, it turns out. Right? Uh, they figure it out. But as the plan for Central Park got underway, there really was not much consideration for Seneca Village or any of the people living in the proposed park space. The initial plan for the park was 779 acres. It was later expanded to its current size of 843 acres. So that was a pretty significant tract of land right in the middle of the city. And even though Manhattan had less and less population density the farther north you went on the island, the land that had been identified as a potential green space for this project was occupied, including Seneca Village, by an estimated 1,600 people. Despite that fact, and despite the fact that Seneca Village had grown into a community on lots that had been purchased from the Whiteheads, the park was generally described as an empty space with a handful of people living there illegally. This may have been a case of supporters of the park plan, including journalists, either willfully ignoring the residents of Seneca Village and other communities in the area, or being truly unaware of how developed these communities were, I would argue if they were journalists, that was their job to figure out. Uh, Or they may have just been devaluing and disregarding the people living there because these communities were made up of Black and immigrant inhabitants. I will point out that journalism was a very different thing at this point. Yeah, I I know, but still. (laughs) Yes. And we don't know the motivation of every journalist who wrote about the proposed land for Central Park as though it were uninhabited. But what we do know is that downplaying any human habitation would have helped make the project more appealing for anyone in the city, particularly any stakeholders, who might have questioned its expense and its purpose. And there was, of course, racism in the mix as well. People who did acknowledge Seneca Village referred to it using a racist slur for years, as we mentioned a little while ago. Uh, It's interesting because when you look at some of the records online, depending on where you see them, some places that show these newspapers, like the image of the actual newspaper, have chosen to black bar the name because it is gross. Um, There was also this general suspicion about any of the white immigrants who lived in the village, and they were characterized as being very shifty and untrustworthy, and there were all these rumors of miscegenation and a lot of racist language about the mixing of these races. Uh, The rhetoric of the park being occupied only by indigent drifters began the erasure of a stable community, both literally in terms of its existence and in the historical record. And we really want to stress the stability of this village. In the book, The Park and the People, authors Roy Rosenzweig and Elizabeth Blackmar note that if you compare Seneca Village's tax records from 1840 to the records from 1855, three quarters of the families from 1840 were still living there. If you compare 1850 to 1855, all of the Black residents in the community were still in Seneca Village. So it's definitely not a case of drifters or squatters. These are people who owned the land, paid taxes, and had that information captured in the city records. Seneca Village was more stable than really most city communities during the mid-1800s. Yeah, they make a point in that book that if you compare Seneca Village to, like, 
uh, I think they mention a neighborhood in Boston at the same time. They're like, this is constant movement. This is almost no movement. Like, it's way more stable. Uh, and in many cases, too, these families were staying through multiple generations with marriages and children and adding to the village's population and reinforcing the community ties within it. So it was the exact opposite of itinerant. Descriptions of the homes in the village during the time when the city was considering where to build a park also characterized them as though they were barely standing. The words shack and shanty were very commonly used. These were definitely not fancy houses. They were generally built by the residents themselves. They tended to be on the smaller side, mostly one story. And there was a wide range of quality from one house to another, but they were there through all those years of records that we mentioned. So they definitely weren't temporary structures on the verge of collapse. In terms of quality of life, if compared to the Black population living downtown, the residents of Seneca Village had significantly more space, as well as outdoor areas for recreation, and they weren't subjected to the cramped and poorly maintained rooms that would have been available in the Five Points neighborhood, where a large portion of the city's Black population lived. Yeah, when you consider that most of the people of color and immigrants living downtown were in tenements that were really poorly managed... This was a way better setup, and again, way more stable, but completely devalued. Uh, most of Seneca Village's male residents worked in service or labor jobs, and the women of the village also worked. They took in laundry. Some of them worked as domestic servants. There were also gardens, and livestock was kept on the Seneca Village acreage that supplemented the diets of the residents. The most well-off among the people who lived there were two grocers and an innkeeper. So it wasn't a wealthy demographic, but it was the highest concentration in the city of an area where Black people owned property. The people debating the future location of the park idea were generally wealthy. As the city had expanded north to take up more and more of the island, it wasn't only William Cullen Bryant who had thoughts of how a park would drive up adjacent property values. There was definitely a recognition that the development of what was being called at the time the Central Park was going to create value in the land of the northern half of the island. Back when Jones Wood, or Jones Woods, you'll see it written both ways, was still being considered as a possible park location, social reformer Hal Guernsey had written a letter to the Tribune in which he said, quote, Will anyone pretend the park is not a scheme to enhance the value of uptown land, create a splendid center for fashionable life, without regard to, and even in dereliction of, the happiness of the multitude upon whose hearts and hands the expenses will fall? Even after that other strip of land was eventually dismissed because it would benefit existing landowners, at this point it was inescapably obvious that any location was going to create a potential new area for affluent buyers to flock to. On July 21st, 1853, the city filed the legal action that would be the demise of Seneca Village. That was when the city claimed eminent domain over the portions of the island from 59th to 106th streets designated for the park for the property that the city did not already own. The city allocated $5 million for the purchase of the properties in that tract that were privately held. But naturally, a lot of those people did not want to give up their homes. And this is not a case where they just went along with it. Many of them fought it for, through legal channels. Over the next two years, there were ongoing court cases and appeal after appeal as the residents of what would become Central Park, and specifically the residents of Seneca Village, tried to hang on to the community they had built. In some instances, those battles were over the amounts of money that the city had allocated for specific properties as their, like, purchase agreement, because the owners really felt that they were being undervalued. As the legal issues churned, the city made a map in 1855 that was an account of all the separate properties and their owners, as well as notes on what dwellings and outbuildings existed on each parcel. This came to be known as the Central Park Condemnation Map. But eventually, all of the legal avenues for the residents were exhausted, and the city was eager to get on with its park project. In the summer of 1856, Mayor Fernando Wood issued an eviction notice for Seneca Village. Still, a lot of the residents resisted. News writers penned incendiary articles indicating that the land should be cleared by any means necessary to make way for the park. That included violence. 
Uh, How things actually played out is a little unclear, though. Some modern versions of this story suggest that police were called in and a violent series of actions resulted often in community members being beaten and dragged from their homes. But there actually aren't any firsthand accounts of how and when the holdout residents finally left or were removed. But by October 1st, 1857, the land set aside for Central Park had no human inhabitants anymore. Demolition of existing structures followed soon after that. By the time Seneca Village was destroyed, 589 people had lived there in its three-decade existence. And we're going to pause here for a sponsor break, and then we'll come back and talk about trying to trace some of Seneca Village's lost history. Construction on Central Park began in 1858, and the lake of the park opened that same year, although construction continued throughout the rest of the park for the next 15 years. Almost as soon as it had been raised, it was as though Seneca Village had never existed, at least in the minds of the people who were enjoying their new park. One of the big historical tragedies is that we don't really know where the residents of Seneca Village went after they were evicted. All Angels Church actually moved their building to a new location on the Upper West Side. The church sexton, William Wilson, moved near the new church location. It's also known that resident Andrew Williams moved with his family to Queens. But beyond that, information is thin to non-existent, and there are still efforts to try to locate information about any of these community members or their descendants. In August 1871, two coffins were accidentally unearthed when landscapers were working in the area of the park where Seneca Village had been. One of those coffins was really, really nice and had an engraved plate on it with the name Margaret McGinty, while the other was a simpler style with no identifiers. Despite the fact that Seneca Village had been an active community there just 15 years prior to this discovery, it was reported as though these coffins were just a complete mystery. There is no evidence the cemeteries of Seneca Village attached to All Angels Church and the AME Zion Church were relocated after the inhabitants of the village were evicted. The burial records from AME Zion burned in 1839, so the earliest records of burials were lost even before that. Yeah, so it's very, very possible that uh, since they basically were knocking down buildings and then covering them with dirt... Uh, it's very possible that they basically just filled in over the cemeteries. It is difficult for historians to research and contextualize the inhabitants of Seneca Village because there aren't, as we've been saying, a lot of records. And many of the records that do exist were created because there was a desire to move those people off of their land. Additionally, as we have talked about on the show before, it was the second half of the 1820s when Nisiphor Nieps started experimenting with photography in France. So there are really no photographs of Seneca Village. Uh, There are a few photos that were taken of the landscape as prep was underway to turn it into a park. And some buildings appear in those photos that may have been part of this, but they aren't the focus. They're sort of off in the distance in the background. And it is not a comprehensive view of the entire community area. There is one family associated with Seneca Village that there are surviving photos of, but they were not residents. Albro and Mary Joseph Lyons had their portraits made, as well as their children's portraits, in the 1860s. So while these are important historical items, they are a degree of remove from actual life in the village. We'll be coming back to them in a moment, though. In 1997, the New York Historical Society mounted an exhibition titled Before Central Park, The Life and Death of Seneca Village, which challenged the long-established story that the area that became Central Park had been essentially a wasteland before Olmsted and Vox worked their landscaping magic. This exhibit also stoked interest in the subject, helping to bolster a bigger exploration of the history of the park's land before it became Central Park. The Seneca Village Project began building on work done through the 1990s. That project was headed by Diana Wall, an anthropology professor at the City College of New York, Nan Rothschild of the Bernard Anthropology Department, and Cynthia Copeland of the New York Historical Society. Wall started research into Seneca Village in the 1990s, building up a case for the project to gain funding. 
Initially, the work that was being done was uh, largely collecting as much documentation as they could related to Seneca Village. And then after soil studies and careful initial probing of the area, it expanded over time into an archaeological dig. And this project was funded through a number of sources. It received a research experiences for undergraduates grant from the National Science Foundation, as well as getting funding from National Geographic, the Durst Foundation, the Gilder Foundation, and Friends of Cornell Edwards. And it required a lot of careful and savvy negotiations to get permissions to actually have access to the park for field work. This is something I have summed up here in just a few sentences, but please know that this work was done in very carefully planned stages over the course of of years. It was really, really uh, an instance of a great deal of dedication on the part of these people who initiated it. In 2011, the first excavation project was conducted at the Seneca Village site that had a combination of classroom prep work, eight weeks of field work, and four weeks of lab work for the undergrad students who participated. Field work started on June 7th of that year, and the excavation located, among other things, the foundation wall and interior of the home of William Godfrey Wilson and Charlotte Moore Wilson. Also, they found a number of artifacts that had been part of daily life in the village, including ceramics, a pipe, a child's shoe, a teapot, things like that. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the things that um, comes up a lot when you're looking at this is that people want to discuss how this was a very poor community, but there's a really lovely video I came across where some of the the people who worked on this project are talking about, like, no, this China is as nice as, like, the middle class would have owned. Um, you know, there are enough things that they found that kind of bolster the idea of, like, it it further enhances this picture of it as a very stable, settled community of people that were not just, like, scratching by. They had a sense of of place and belonging and stability there. Uh, in 2015, new archaeological work began on the site of Seneca Village as the playgrounds that have been on the plot of land where the village once existed were set to undergo renovation. The Central Park Conservancy also initiated an effort of archival research alongside the archaeological work during this construction project in an effort to create a more thorough record of the land's history. The result of this project in recent years has been the installation of a number of signs in the park that note the locations of various village buildings and the village's residents. In the fall of 2019, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio announced that Central Park would get a historical monument about Seneca Village, focusing specifically on the Lyons family who we mentioned earlier. While they did not live in Seneca Village, they were prominent members of Manhattan's 19th century Black community, and they ran a stop on the Underground Railroad in the city. Submissions for the design of that monument were supposed to be open until April of this year, but the pandemic has probably put the brakes on that plan. Yeah, hard to dig up information (laughs) once everything went left. Um, It's cool to me that this has gotten a lot more attention in recent years. And I like that, I mean, those people that we mentioned on the the Seneca Village project, they are still working on this. And there's still, you know, archival analysis that goes on. And and I don't know if there are plans for additional digs. But it's one of those things that uh, has kind of cropped up in the news in recent years. But I thought it might be nice to really talk about just how complete this community was because it's Mm -hmm. not often talked about in that way um it's a um in that way a cool thing and i don't i'm really really glad that they're making efforts to document pre-park history of that area um i love central park but i also am not ignorant to the fact that it did not just sprout out of nowhere with land that no one ever had Uh, (laughs) so i hope uh that uh, we'll get more. I hope more and more stuff comes to light about Seneca Village and the people that live there. Um, I love it. Anyway, that's what's up. Do you want some listener mail? I sure do. This listener mail's about bonsai. Um, This is from our listener, Keith, who writes, Hey, Holly and Tracy, I've been listening for a long time. I just heard your podcast on bonsai. I'm a little behind. I don't think that sounds behind. That sounds pretty contemporary. Uh, He says that I'm so excited to actually have a reason to contact you both. I work at a museum in Colorado, and while this isn't my specialty, I did really want to mention Colorado's role in modern bonsai in the U.S. and around the world. You spoke of the role of Japanese internment camps in bonsai. To my understanding, the internment camp in Colorado, known as Amachi or Granada, was instrumental in the resurgence of bonsai in both the U.S. and Japan after the war. 
Amashi was the smallest of the camps, but it held four expert bonsai artists. So the art was common there, classes developed, and it was picked up by many of the other prisoners. Because the plants near the camp weren't traditional bonsai trees, the camp prisoners used non-traditional local trees, such as junipers. This was the beginning of a new style of bonsai, which focused on the plants of the area that you are in instead of limiting the craft to traditional bonsai trees. That idea was transported back to Los Angeles after the war and eventually back to Japan. After the camp was disbanded, many of the internees from Amachi remained in Colorado. Colorado's Governor Ralph Carr was the only governor who welcomed the internees to remain as part of their state. Denver actually had two bonsai clubs for years, one that spoke English and one that was dominated by former internees and spoke exclusively in Japanese. The Denver Botanic Garden still has a wonderful Japanese garden and a thriving bonsai club that we wouldn't have without this history, all of which leads me to a podcast suggestion, and he mentions Ralph Carr. Uh, He says, anyway, I hope that's interesting to you and not just a waste of your time. Thanks for all the history of the year. Stay safe and healthy. That's super interesting to me. Um, And now I have a place on my list of things to do next time I am in Denver uh, because I absolutely want to go see the Botanic Garden. Uh... It's we've had a few people write to us about bonsai, which I love, including um, our listener Maggie, who <laughs> shared a picture of one of hers that uh, no longer survives, but was very, very pretty. Uh, I, I love it. I like hearing about all people's interest in in bonsai and trees in general. It's great. So please keep sharing those. They're all interesting to me. Uh, if you would like to write to us, you could do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can find us on social media as Missed in History. And if you would like to subscribe to the podcast, we hope that you do. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.